Daniel 9, verses 4 to 19. Daniel's prayer. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far, in all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. We and our kings, our princes, and our ancestors are covered with shame, Lord, because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us for his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the word spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing on us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us, yet we have not sought the favour of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster on us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. Now, Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned, we have done wrong. Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the iniquities of our ancestors have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. <clears throat> now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favour on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, our God, and hear. Open, our eye, open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay, because your city and your people Bear your name. So let's pray. Father, we, as we thank you for um, the, the good news that Easter offers us, it also comes with a bit of a challenge. And so Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit to, to challenge us this morning, to um, open our eyes to uh, what, the, what, what it means uh, when, uh, to, to reflect on Jesus giving his life, but actually also to draw forth what the, what the good out of that is, what the good news is for that for us. I just invite you to speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, hmm. You've probably heard the saying, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Yeah. Have you heard that? Yep, okay. How true is that? I mean, ha how many of you have had to pay for every single lunch you've had? <laughs> yeah, you've paid for every single lunch. Okay, well, there's a couple. Uh, you're very good. See, I remember as a kid, see, I had free lunches all the time. Uh, Mum made them for me every morning. Uh, uh, and, and I, I mean, I didn't always like what I got, but it was free. But I guess if you think about it, um, while it might have been free for me, it did cost someone something. Um, cost mum the bread, or oh, mum or dad, one of the two. Um, and, and perhaps this is what the saying's getting at here. There is always a cost. You know, someone always has to pay. Um, and if that's true of lunches, um, it's certainly true of larger issues like justice. Um, let's, let's say, for example, I decide to steal 100 bucks off Roger. 
um, and spent it all on gambling. And then later I began to feel a little bit bad about it. So I go to Roger a bit, little bit later and say, Roger, I'm really sorry, but I stole $100 off you and I don't have the money to pay you back. Yeah, I know he will. Oh, that's exactly what I thought too. Roger's a forgiving Christian man. Um, and surely the forgiving Christian man that Roger is. He would say to me, Nick, I, I forgive you, Nick. Keep the money. It's all good. And that might be wonderful news for me. I'm, I'm free from having to pay Roger back. But guess what? <laughs> Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the great news for me has come as a personal cost to Roger. Um, and that's an important truth for us to grapple with as Christians, because as, port, as important as the subject of forgiveness is, it still means somebody has to pay. Forgiveness offered freely doesn't come without a price. Somebody has to be willing to carry the cost. And this is a really significant thing theologically. Throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, there is this question, who is going to pay? Or, or you, if you like, who's going to take responsibility for our choices? Um, beginning in Genesis chapter 3, which we've been going back to right through this series. Adam and Eve, they were offered what sounded like a great deal. Choose your own way. Take responsibility for yourselves. Um, your eyes will be opened and then you will be like God. And to, to them, being like God sounded like a great idea. They could direct the course of their lives. But this was a decision that came with a cost. And this impact of this decision was generational. It didn't just affect them, it affected those who came along. Within one chapter, following in his parents' footsteps, Adam and Eve's son Cain decided the best way to direct the course of his life was to murder his brother, to get out, get out on top. And progressively, it got worse and worse from there, as Adam and Eve's decision to, to make their own way had repercussions for everyone who followed after them. Now, we fast forward from this time into the... We're going to do a bit of time jumps through the sermon. We're going to fast forward now to the time of the Israelites in Egypt. And in the depths of slavery, uh, the people of Israel, they're crying out to God to deliver them from the evil that surrounded them. And so God does that. He steps in, he delivers them. And doing so, he set apart... He gave them some laws uh, that set them apart from the rest of the world. So he became their God and they became his people. And along with these laws were these things called sacrifices. Now, in, in ancient times, sacrificing to the gods wasn't an unusual thing to do uh, for a nation. Basically, it's how you controlled your god and got him or her to do things for you. If you needed a small favour, you could complete a small ritual. If you, if you needed a bigger favour, you gave a bigger sacrifice. And if you were really, really in trouble, then you kind of had to offer something really precious in order to get your god to bless you. Now, the obvious problem for the system in the ancient world was if your God didn't seem to be listening, what would you have to do to get their attention? You know, there was like a, a scale that just kept increasing. You had to up the ante. And unfortunately, this often ended up in some pretty horrendous social practices and sacrificial practices like human sacrifice, all those kind of things you see on Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Um, pretty nasty stuff. However, in Israel, according to God's law, sacrifices were not about earning points with God or trying to twist his arm to get him to do what you wanted. Essentially, sacrifices were about two things. Thanks and forgiveness. You either thanked God for what he'd already done, or you asked forgiveness for what you'd done against him and his law. And these, these sacrifices, particularly the sacrifices for forgiveness, were very prescriptive. You kind of, they were kind of all set in stone. You knew what they were going to be. Um, but the essential element for these sacrifices, um, particularly for forgiveness, included something that was a little bit dramatic. It was, called, it was the shedding of blood so of a substitute animal in your place. Now, I love the look of that sheep. Uh, oh, that's weird. Um, okay. <laughs> Sacrifice E. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, now coming out of a, a non-sacrificial environment, as most of us do, this whole idea of sacrifice, it does seem a bit weird, doesn't it? Does it yeah. Okay, you might ask, well, why, why did God say I forgive you? Um, it's all good. You know, don't do it again and, and just leave that little lamb alone. Yeah. And in fact, in Isaiah 11, uh, sorry, Isaiah 1, 11, God himself says, I take no pleasure in the blood of, blood of bulls and lambs and goats. And so if this is the case, why did God introduce sacrifices in the first place? 
Well, it all comes back to this idea, um, back to the fact that there are no free lunches. Somebody always has to pay. Adam and Eve's decision to reject God and go their own way came at a cost. It cost them, but it also cost the people who followed after them. And in the same way for the Israelites, this act of sacrifice highlighted the fact that their sins came at a cost as well. When they strayed from God's ways, other people suffered. And more often than not, this cost was borne by, an, by innocent people. So when a blameless animal was offered as a sacrifice, this was a significant act. It was symbolic of the way that your sin has an impact on those around you. And it pointed to this idea that what we do affects others. Somebody has to pay. Forgiveness doesn't come without a, a cost. Now let's do another time jump. 900 years from Moses. Um, the people of Israel are now living in the, living in the land of Babylon. They've been evicted from um, the, the land of Israel. Um, and, and, and the reason they were in Babylon was once again they'd rejected God's ways. Um, God's plans and chosen their own ways, adopting the practices of the gods of other nations. And the result of, their, of, of turning away from God was literally blood on the streets. Kind of noticing this pattern here of people falling away. And one of the worst effectors, uh, offenders of that time was King Manasseh of Judah. Um, 2 Kings 21 tells us Manasseh sent, shed so much innocent blood that he filled Jerusalem from end to end. And basically it gets to the point where God says, enough. And so he calls the Babylonians and they come and they take the people of Israel and take them into captivity. Not only that, they destroy the temple where all the sac animal sacrifices had taken place, which of course raises the question, well, how do we sacrifice for our sins anymore? Now at this time um, in Babylon, one of the leaders of, of the Israelites, a guy called Daniel, he begins to pray on behalf of God. No, sorry, on behalf of the people for, for God's forgiveness. And, and Daniel, he's not one to mix words. He kind of gets right to the heart of the issue. He says, Lord, you're righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. We haven't obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All this disaster has come upon us, yet we've not sought the favor of the Lord by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. You know, Daniel's just straight up. He's, he's saying, we've messed up. Everything that's come upon our, uh, us, we've brought upon ourselves. Let's not, we're not fooling anyone here. But then he goes on to say this. He says, um, we don't make a request of you because we're righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and Lord, act. Because your city and your people be your name. Listen and forgive. Hear and act. Daniel cries out to God, not offering excuses. He doesn't even say, hey, God, if you do this, I'll pay you back. Because as a nation... He, he realises that they're morally bankrupt. They've got nothing to offer. Instead, all Daniel can say is, if you don't forgive us, God, we're going to make you look stupid. That's his best argument. And so what's Daniel doing here? He's asking God to carry the cost for their wrongdoing. A bit like a, a child who's stolen the family car and crashed it without insurance. You know, I'm in a spot of bother here, Dad. I need some help. But what's really interesting here is God's response to Daniel. And this is where it starts tying into Easter. Uh, because while Daniel's praying, God sends an angel, angel to him with a, a little bit of a prophetic outline, if you like, as to what's going to happen next. Um, in Daniel 9 and 24, God says this, 70 sevens are decreed for your people in your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up a vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Now, initially, it seems a real bit of a weird kind of answer to what Daniel's praying. But what's going on here? God's saying that in a certain amount of, a certain amount of time will pass before God will deal with what seems to be the root problems of Israel's unfaithfulness. And the angel uses these phrases, um, ending sin, atoning or, or paying for wickedness, Bringing in righteousness and sealing vision and prophecy. So what's this about? Well, essentially, God's using the language of sacrifice. He's promising that he's going to pay for the cost of Israel's sin and transgression. That's what sin and atoning and righteousness was all about. And interesting, when it goes to the point of sealing prophecy and vision, 
Um, this is bringing to a conclusion all these promises that we've been talking about, like the future um, prophet that Moses had promised and the future king that had been promised to David. And then in the very next verse after that, God introduces another mystery character to come, someone called the Anointed One. Um, 25 and 26, it goes, no one understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Anointed One, the ruler comes, there will be 77s and 62 sevens. It will be re rebuilt with streets and trench. This is Jerusalem. Uh, but in the time of trouble. And after 62 sevens, the Anointed One will be put to death and have nothing. So, so who's this anointed one? Well, interestingly, the Hebrew translation of the name anointed one is the word Messiah. Ooh. So the Messiah would come at a certain time, it says, and then be put to death. Now, at this stage, nothing more was said about the anointed one. It was still a bit of a mystery. But if, looking from our kind of perspective, if you take into account God promising to end sin, to pay for wickedness, to bring in righteousness and fulfill vision, as well as a promise of a Messiah, who does this, what does this sound like? Sounds like the Easter story, doesn't it? Sounds like the ministry of Jesus, a lot like what Jesus said about himself. Which is interesting because you notice how they talked about the sevens? If you take those sevens to be groups of years and you do the maths from the time of the decree to rebuild um, Jerusalem, you find yourself around about the time of Jesus. Which explains why the people of Israel were getting really excited when Jesus turned up on Palm Sunday. Because these times matched up with the promise of a coming Messiah. And Jesus was a great prophet, unlike anyone had ever seen before, for the time of Moses. And Jesus was a great leader, like David. Hordes of people followed him and, and hung on his every word. But then, unexpectedly, at the height of his power... Arriving in Jerusalem with all these crowds celebrating around him, he was betrayed, murdered, and hung on a cross. And for pretty much everyone at that time, that did not make any sense. How could the Messiah die like a common criminal? You know, that shouldn't happen to someone who was a prophet. And it wouldn't happen to someone who was a king. But it would happen to a sacrifice. Just like in the practice of the temple, where innocent animals were offered in payment for the sins of the people, someone had to pay. And when it comes to freeing us from the consequences of sin, there is always a cost. Someone will always pay. And this time, that someone was Jesus. This was why Jesus was called the Lamb of God, the one who takes away the sins of the world. In, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it puts it this way. It says, God made him who had no sin be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, God took it upon himself to pay for us what we could not pay for ourselves. And this is the good news. You know, if there was another way, if there was something else we could do to save ourselves, then the cross would make no sense. It would just be for the people who can get, the, get their lives put together. But just like God promised Daniel, God came to break us free from our inability to save ourselves and to offer us his righteousness. He bore the brunt of our sin and the rejection of God. And he paid a cost for us that none of us can pay. Which means the slate has been wiped clean between us and God. And there's nothing we can do that can add to what Jesus has already done. Which when you think about that, there's nothing, that we, nothing else that we can do to add to what Jesus has done. That's got some real practical implications for us. Because I think one of the traps we fall into as Christians is that, hey, if we only did this better or that better, then God would be happier for us and da 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 As if we could add to what Jesus has done by being a better person. And yet the gospel is really clear on this. It tells us that we're not saved on the basis of our works, but by what Jesus has done for us. He has paid the cost. And therefore, our lives ought to reflect that, just living out in thankfulness um, and, and, and tr knowing that hope that he is always with us and he'll never leave us. And that even when we walk through the darkest of places, that God does not abandon us. This good news provides peace and solidity in our souls that the world cannot offer us. 
So instead of living with this weight of feeling, oh, we don't measure up to God's best for us, instead we can realize the joy that comes with knowing that there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Jesus died so we wouldn't have to save ourselves. We stand upon his shoulders. He has paid our debt. And that is a truth that changes you. It changes the way we look at ourselves, and it should change the way we look at others as well. Instead of ranking ourselves against others, who's better than us? Who's the super Christians? I met up with a bishop the other day. <laughs> you know, you almost had these rankings of who's, who's the best. But actually, no. Jesus is saying, I've saved you all. And we can start, we start looking at people as people, as people that God is passionate about. So this morning, I want to leave you with this, this question. Who are you going to put your trust in? Do you believe that Jesus has paid the cost for your sin? Or are you counting on your capacity to sort out your own mess? See, Jesus said, if you trust me, follow me. Put aside your striving to save yourself, or you're comparing yourself to others, and start following my ways instead. Trust that I have covered the cost of your failure and weakness. Put that aside. And allow me to change you and form you in the way that you're created in my time. Let's pray. Jesus, you know, we often say we trust you for our salvation. But sometimes our lives tell a different story. As if everything depends on us and what we do. And so often, as a result, we feel a little bit like the Israelites, that we're covered with shame. Because we're trusting in our capacity for righteousness and not what you've done for us. So we don't make requests for you because we're righteous. And instead we come before you because you are the one who saves. You're the one who's paid the price for the rebellion that we've, 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 we've worked against you. So Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for holding on to attitudes like pride and judgment or unworthiness and fear of rejection, because these are all things that actually stop us from taking hold of the life that you've given us. Father, I'd ask that you would renew our hearts and minds, that we would start to live like renewed people, like forgiven people, that we wouldn't walk like uh, people who live in the power and the love that Jesus came to offer us. Lord, we pray, listen. Lord, we pray, forgive Lord, we pray, hear and act for your sake, God. Don't delay because your church and your people bear your name. Amen.